Welcome to part four on chapter five learning. Now at the end of part three, I asked you, can a parent, can a coach, can a boss give continuous reinforcement to people? And we said, of course not. It's not very efficient. Partial or intermittent reinforcement works very nicely as an alternative. This is when reinforcement does not occur after every behavior. I'm going to illustrate this with a coach supervising athletes in the weight room. And the issue is, how do I get the most behavior out of my athlete? You'll see that some schedules of reinforcement are better than others. We have two types of partial reinforcement. Ratio, when we reinforce the person after so many behaviors. And interval when we reinforce a person after so much time has lapsed, whether they do anything or not. The ratio schedule can be fixed when a person is only reinforced after producing a specific number of behaviors, or the ratio schedule can be variable when a person is reinforced after producing on average a specific number of behaviors, but doesn't really know the exact average. And in the same way, the interval schedule can be fixed. When a person is only reinforced after a specific amount of time has lapsed, whether they did anything or not. And just like with a ratio schedule, the interval schedule can be variable. When a person is reinforced after, on average, a specific time has elapsed, but doesn't know the exact average, and again, whether they do anything or not. Let's say coach provides positive reinforcement in the form of praise, support, and attention to an athlete after he performs four sets of weightlifting. The athlete gets no attention until four sets have been completed. This is a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. And it's really easy, it's, it's relatively easy to figure out, isn't it, what's going on. Reinforcement is given after a fixed amount of behavior. In this case, four sets of eight, nine, or 10 reps. Our example will be called an FR. But now, coach wants a higher rate of behavior. He could provide reinforcement on average after every fourth set of weightlifting. Sometimes he gives reinforcement after three sets, sometimes after five sets, sometimes after two, sometimes after six, and so on. But on average, it is after every four sets. We call this a variable ratio schedule of reinforcement. This is more difficult to figure out what's going on here, don't you think, than in a fixed ratio schedule? So it keeps a person on their toes with a higher rate of reinforcement because you never know when the positive reinforcement is going to come through, when coach is going to notice you. Reinforcement is given after a variable amount of behavior, and our example would be called a VR, a VR4. Next, Coach decides to experiment a little bit and provide reinforcement after 10 minutes. It doesn't matter how much or how little weightlifting you do during this 10 minute period, but after the time period elapses, coach, if coach sees you lifting weight, he's going to come over and provide encouragement. This is a fixed interval schedule of reinforcement. Reinforcement is given after a fixed interval of time. And it's relatively easy to figure out, and it encourages very little behavior until the time interval has expired. So probably the least efficient way to provide positive reinforcement, not good at all. It's the weakest, and our example would be called an FI-10. Well, coach recognizes the error of his ways. We'll hope it's not too late and now decides to vary the interval of reinforcement so that it averages around 10 minutes each time. 
We call this a variable interval schedule of reinforcement. It reinforces just a slightly higher rate of behavior. It's a little better than a fixed interval schedule. Our example would be called a VI-10. I invite you to think about schedules of reinforcement that parents, teachers, coaches, whoever use on you, and schedules of reinforcement that you use on other people. Are these schedules effective? Are they getting the most out of you? Are you getting the most out of other people? Or could they be improved? But remember, partial reinforcement is whatever the schedule is better than continuous reinforcement. And now for the last major topic in our lesson, punishment. Punishment is the other half of operant conditioning. Now up till this point, it's all been about how to increase behavior. Now we want to look at decreasing or, or stopping behavior. And I cannot overemphasize this point. Negative reinforcement is not the same as punishment. Punishment is not the same as reinforcement. Punishment is the application of an unpleasant stimulus which lowers the probability of a behavior, it can be largely psychological, as in, as in this example, such as public shame and humiliation. Punishment can be physical, up to and including torture. Punishment may also entail the removal of a pleasant stimulus, which lowers the probability of behavior or stops it altogether. These boys are getting rowdy and creating unsafe conditions for the other swimmers. The lifeguard will remove them and she'll make them sit on the deck for mm, maybe 10 minutes before allowing them back in the water. And the behavior should stop. Most parents occasionally spank their child. A quick slap on the hand or the rear will immediately stop a potentially injurious behavior. It could even save a child's life. And yet, physical punishment remains controversial. Psychologists are sometimes portrayed in the media as advising parents to never lay a hand on their child. Well, I want to tell you that nothing further could be, that nothing could be further from the truth. That said, there is a growing body of evidence that suggests that the exclusive use of physical punishment for non-self-destructive behavior without any other disciplinary techniques such as positive and negative reinforcement, response cost, or time out is associated with a slightly higher risk of potential problems as the child grows older. You need to be aware of this literature and then use your own judgment about what to do. Here are some of the major findings. Physical punishment is suppressive and it'll stop the behavior, but it does not eliminate behavior. In other words, a child may control their misbehavior or, or aggressive impulses, whatever at home, because if he doesn't, he knows the consequences will be painful. But he behaves differently at school because up until now, there's been no consequence. This may even come as a surprise to the parent who says, he doesn't do this at home. I don't know why he would do that at school. Physical punishment by itself doesn't show the appropriate behavior. It demonstrates what's wrong, but by itself doesn't say what's right. A child learns what not to do, but he or she, he or she may truly not know what to do, such as how to express anger without swearing. Physical punishment can result in a person becoming fearful. The child may begin to experience anxiety or want to escape or run away.
Physical punishment can create withdrawn behavior. The child may become disengaged and alienated from parents and others. And finally, physical punishment can lead to aggression. Children frequently rely on what they observe in the home to be normal. The child may learn that physical aggression is the best way to solve problems. Now, in addition to the reinforcement techniques discussed earlier, as well as response cost and time out, here are some recommendations for you if you do use spanking or physical punishment. Number one, make the physical punishment immediately. To say, wait until your father comes home, may be confusing. A younger child in particular may not can make the proper connection between what they did in the morning and now getting punished much later at night. Number two, make the physical punishment of minimum severity to suppress the behavior. Otherwise, you're at risk to lose control and vent anger and become abusive. Child Protective Services here in New Mexico recommends that you count to 10 before you lay a hand on your child. I think that's great advice. And third, make the physical punishment consistent. You cannot ignore the misbehavior one day and then punish it on the next day. This may result in that the child learns that he or she can get away with a higher level of misbehavior over the course of several days before there's consequences. Those are recommendations. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you next time in Chapter 6, Memory. Take care.